Moedim la simcha, happy feast days to all. Some of us, like myself, may have just recently finished our Feast of Unleavened Bread, while some of you perhaps may be just entering in. This is part two of Eminem Hebrews Passover series. In part one, I address thoroughly what leavening is and showing you through the scriptures that it's more than just yeast and vinegar. If you haven't watched it, I advise you do so. In today's video, I will be speaking on the Passover Seder plate. Is it necessary to eat lamb? Do we just eat matzah? Do we have to paint real blood's lamb on our doors? What do we eat and all things alike? So please subscribe to our channel if you are interested in more related content. I also would like to invite you all to our upcoming Olpan Ivrit, which are our Hebrew classes where students will learn to read, write, and speak Hebrew. The date of our registration opening will be posted in our community page. Seven days thou shalt eat unleavened bread, and in the seventh day shall be a feast to Yahweh. Unleavened bread shall be eaten seven days, and there shall no leavened bread be seen with thee, neither shall there be any leaven with thee in all thy quarters. And thou shalt show thy son in that day, saying, This is done because of that which Yahweh did unto me when I came forth out of Egypt. And it shall be for a sign unto thee upon thy hand, and for a memorial between thy eyes, that Yahweh's law may be in thy mouth. For with a strong hand hath Yahweh brought thee out of Egypt. Thou shalt therefore keep this ordinance in his season from year to year. As it's been clearly stated in these scriptures, Yahweh is commanding that we eat unleavened bread for seven days straight as a memorial for our deliverance from Egypt through the hand of Yahweh. Thou shalt therefore sacrifice the Passover unto Yahweh of the flock and the herd, and the place which Yahweh shall choose to place his name there. Thou shalt eat no leavened thing with it. Seven days shalt thou eat unleavened bread therewith the bread of affliction. For thou camest forth out of the land of Egypt in haste, that thou mayest remember the day when thou camest forth out of the land of Egypt all the days of thy life. So this is further proof that during our Passover meal, in addition to unleavened bread, nothing containing chametz should be eaten with that meal or any other time during that week. He also calls matzah the bread of affliction because we came out of Egypt in haste. And those of you who choose to wait to the last minute to leave Babylon, you will also eat of this same bread of affliction. Lechem oni, the bread of affliction. What is it? On basis, it means to be afflicted and impoverished, but it also means to be miserable, depressed, and defiled. Hold on to these definitions as we're coming right back to it. So the word lechem is a direct derivative of the word lacham, which means to fight, to battle or to war. And you might be thinking to yourself, well, what does bread have to do with fighting? On a physical perspective, while kneading dough, there is a lot of pounding with fists, a lot of rolling, flipping, slapping, even heat and tension. You might even break a sweat sometimes trying to knead a lump of dough. And the first time we see lechem in the Bible is in Genesis 3.19. It says, in the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground. For out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. This is a part of the curse that Adam and mankind has been subjected by, which is being forced to eat bread. We've been given two options, to eat the bread of life, which is to eat the word of Yahweh Yehoshua. And in order to eat the word of Yahweh Yehoshua, it requires a constant affliction of our souls, a war, and a fight against our own desires. And David speaks beautifully in Psalms 119 about his endurance through tribulation, which involved having the word of Yahweh continuously in his heart and mind. And it was a comfort to his soul during his affliction. So again, we have the option to either eat the bread of life or continue to be under Pharaoh and eat defiled bread. This is the very same defiled bread Ezekiel ate which was a direct reflection of the mindset of our people back then and now. It symbolized the state of what our forefathers and what we would go through living amongst the Gentiles. 
Now us coming out of the places in which we've been scattered, especially Babylon America, throughout this Rapture Doctrine series, I've given numerous examples about the uncleanliness of that place and how it affects us both physically, mentally, and spiritually. And Yahweh says to Ezekiel that one day he would cut off his bread in Jerusalem. And Jerusalem is the people. He's going to remove his bread, which is his word and his spirit, and that we would eat bread full of anxiety and drink water by measure, which is a form of oppression and also misery, and that we would be in want after true bread and true water, which is the bread of life. And isn't that something we are all looking for today? So we eat this bread at the Passover meal and the remaining seven days in memory of our forefathers' affliction, which was ultimately caused by sin, and also in reflection of us in the present, as we are coming out of our own captivity, both physically and spiritually, removing the leaven out of our hearts and releasing ourselves from the bondage of our own Pharaoh, aiming to partake of that bread of life. This is a Hebrew blessing my family and myself recite during our Passover meal that you may also incorporate into your memorial if you wish. It goes like this, Baruch Ata Yahweh Eloheinu, Melech Haolam, Hamotzi Lechem Min Haaretz, Wekidshanu Bemitzotau Wetsiwanu Al Achilat Matza. I'll read it one more time. Baruch Ata Yahweh Eloheinu, Melech Haolam, Hamotzi Lechem Min Haaretz, Wekidshanu Bemitzotau Wetsiwanu Al Achilat Matza. And this means, blessed are you, Yahweh, our powers, king of the universe, that brings forth bread from the earth and has sanctified us in his commandment and commands us to eat matzah. On the same night the Israelites came out of Egypt, there was a plague of the killing of the firstborn. And in order for that covering to take place, they had to make a sacrifice. Now why? The first thing to consider is that the Israelites were in sin against Yahweh because they were not keeping the law, which required a sin offering, which requires, according to the Levitical precepts, it requires meat, bread without leaven or honey, as well as a drink offering. And all drink offerings were strong drink, not juice, by the way. It needs to be strong drink, and specifically wine. And we keep these practices as a shadow of what took place in the tabernacle. And Yehoshua also tells us that as often as we come together in him, which would include his feast days and his Shabbats, we are to drink his blood, which is the wine. And after all, it's a feast. So I would like to share with you another blessing we recite specifically over the wine during memorial. It goes like this, Baruch Ata Yahweh Eloheinu, Melech Haolam, Bore Pri Hagafen. I'll say it one more time, Baruch Ata Yahweh Eloheinu, Melech Haolam, Bore Pri Hagafen. It means, Blessed are you, Yahweh, our powers, King of the universe, who creates the fruit of the vine. The third item which should be added to your Passover meal are bitter herbs. We eat this in remembrance of the bitter and the sorrowful lives our fathers experienced while in slavery, which again was caused by sin, and also we got too comfortable in Egypt instead of returning home to Canaan after the famine. Likewise, this should also apply to the bitter and sorrowful lives we have lived out in sin because of our idolatry and our rebellion against Yahweh, he has scattered us among the Gentile, which we saw earlier that this would give us a defiled state of mind as a part of our curses, and he would cause us to consume gall and wormwood, which is a plague. It is sickness mentally and physically. Jeremiah 9, because they have forsaken my law, which I have set before them, and have not obeyed my voice, nor walked according to it. Herefore, thus says Yahweh of hosts, the Elohim of Israel, behold, I will feed them with wormwood and give them water of gall to drink. I will scatter them also among the Gentiles, and whom neither 
they nor their fathers have known. And I will send a sword after them until I have consumed them. One way or another, we have all drunk of these bitter herbs. And we should remember that the affliction we've experienced is the chastisement of Yahweh, which is mercy. Now, bitter herbs have the ability both to poison and to heal. And we can choose how we want to move forward in our affliction. Lamentations 3. I am the man who has seen affliction by the rod of his wrath. He has filled me with bitterness and has made me drink wormwood. I remember my affliction and roaming, the wormwood and the gall. My soul still remembers and sinks within me. This I recall to mind. Therefore, I have hope. Therefore, we eat the bitter herbs in remembrance of the bitterness, the sorrow, and the bondage we were once in, but in joy for the hope that we have all been given through Yehoshua. Here are some examples of bitter herbs that you can include in your Passover meal. Bitter herbs are known to cleanse the GI tract. Many of them are antiparasitic. Uh, many of them are high in antioxidants, they're antibacterials, and many of them even have blood cleansing effects. And pertaining specifically to the cleansing of the GI tract and the blood, it's no coincidence that Yahweh commanded this ordinance as a shadow as to what we're supposed to be doing spiritually. There are many scriptures that speaks of cleansing and renewing the mind. If you look in the Hebrew, different organs are metaphorically used for the term mind. Um, they are considered to be the seat of our emotions spiritually and physically. And it's proven scientifically that our thoughts have a physical effect on our hearts, our organs, and they also alter your DNA pattern, which is your blood. And I don't want to get too much off topic, but for more on this matter, you can watch the past video I made, which is called Musal Klayot, and I speak a little bit about this matter. And also, if you like science, I will link some videos about the tie between emotions, DNA, and the mind. The last thing I want to mention is that the bitter herbs you might season your lamb with, like parsley, cilantro, and oregano, does not make up for the herbs that should be on your plate. You need to have fresh herbs on your Seder plate. That same night, they are to eat the meat roasted over the fire, along with bitter herbs and bread made without yeast. Do not eat the meat raw or boiled in water, but roast it over a fire with the head, legs, and internal organs. Do not leave any of it till morning. If some is left till morning, you must burn it. This is how you are to eat it, with your cloak tucked in your belt, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. Eat it in haste. It is Yahweh's Passover. So the final item that should be on your Passover plate is lamb. As we just read, it should be roasted over a fire. So nowadays, many of us may live in apartments, or don't have an open space that permits you to be able to roast a whole animal. So in my home, we have either been roasting it in the oven or on the grill. Now, if you have a large community of people and are able to buy a whole lamb, by all means, get a whole lamb. Now, I don't know what that looks like in America, but over here in Jordan and Egypt, that's not a problem. If you are a household that is too small for a whole lamb and you don't have anyone to split it with, then Yahweh knows the intent of your heart. Do the best that you can do and buy according to the pound at your local supermarket. Now, do you have to also roast internal organs? Now, this is not a sacrifice. Remember, it's a memorial. So after the Levitical law was written, we can see clearly that internal organs were burnt and left aside for Yahweh only while we select organs that the priest could eat. So if you desire... You may roast and eat the organs that is permissible to eat, such as the intestines, the stomach, and the brain. Also, if you don't eat all the meat, you cannot save it for yourself the next day. This is an offering for Yahweh, so it must be left to burn throughout the night. In this case, we leave the remaining meat to burn in the oven on a low temperature till it's completely disintegrated. So it's commonly believed that we shouldn't or it's not necessary to eat the Passover lamb. So first of all, it says to keep the ordinance forever from year 
to year, from generation to generation. Many of our people have adopted the thought process of the Jews. The Jews teach, and perhaps there are some slight differences in doctrine, but because they teach that because we don't have a temple or a Levitical priesthood anymore, we can't partake of the sacrifice. So what's missing in their doctrine is Yehoshua. No, we don't have a temple anymore, but Yehoshua said, where two or three are gathered in my name, he is present. And Paul also says that the tabernacle is inside of us. We don't need a physical building in order to keep his ordinances. It's also taught that Yehoshua did away with the law after his crucifixion. So Yehoshua says that he didn't come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. So the only law that was quote unquote nailed to the cross was stoning after sin was committed, as well as animal sacrifice, burnt offerings. Why? Because one, as we know, Yehoshua was the last lamb sacrifice, but Yahweh's desire was always that we would walk in sincerity, having a desire inwardly to keep his Torah, and not just on the outward appearance. This is a part of the leavening of the Pharisees, having a dirty inner cup appearing to be righteous on the outside. The word says, for the law is only a shadow of good things to come. And we know that shadow was Yehoshua. Not the realities themselves. It can never by the same sacrifice be offered year after year. Make perfect those who draw near to worship. He says, sacrifices and offerings, burnt offerings and sin offerings you did not desire, nor did you delight in them, although they are offered according to the law. Then he adds, here I am, I have come to do your will. He takes away the first to establish the second. And by that will, we have been sanctified through the sacrifice of the body of Yehoshua once and for all. We know that sacrifice was a burnt offering, the lamb, that was the atonement for all man's sin. And up next, we're going to see what the establishment of the second covenant is. It says, the Holy Spirit also testifies to us about this. First, he says, This is my covenant I will make with them. After those days, declares Yahweh, I will put my laws in their hearts and inscribe them on their minds. And this is a quote from Jeremiah. So the new covenant that was made was that the law is now to be written in our hearts, not forced as it was before. This new covenant had nothing to do with abolishing the ordinances and the statues and commandments that he created from thousands of years before. Now that we don't need to sacrifice an animal, we've been commanded to kill our own flesh, which is not walking in the ways of the flesh. The word says, but now we have been delivered from the law. That law was immediate death or stoning or having to give a burnt offering after you committed a sin having died to what we were held by so that we should serve in the newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. Again, he said to keep this ordinance from year to year, from generation to generation forever. Yahweh is not a liar. Now, what some may refer to as communion, which is the bread and the wine we've been commanded to, talk, to partake of was again a shadow. It was a memorial of what took place in the tabernacle. This was a drink and a grain offering. Everything that Yehoshua did with disciples was an example of instruction of what they were to do when he left. The bread, the bitter herbs, the wine, and the lamb is all a memorial and symbolic of the sacrifice that we are to do inwardly. And to exclude the lamb from off the plate is half of a sacrifice. It's faulty and it's not acceptable. Also, for those of you who are still painting blood on your door, once again, you have to remember that this is not a sacrifice. It is a memorial and it is a shadow of what we are supposed to be doing inwardly. Also, in terms of putting the blood on the door, the only time it was mentioned the night they left Egypt inside of in Numbers, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, where it gives the commandment for Passover, nothing is mentioned to paint blood on the doors nor do we have any example from Joshua, Chronicles, and Kings that shows our forefathers putting blood on doors. Now, some may say on Yehoshua's Last Supper, it didn't mention anything about having lamb. 
or bitter herbs. And I'm going to show you on the next video in part three that the Last Supper was not on a Passover. I will prove that in part three, which will coincide with me showing that Passover can only take place on a Wednesday evening. In the meantime, Shabbat Shalom and Chag Sameach.